So good morning, everybody. We were supposed to have student testimonies, I think, from the Brazil trip today, but I preempted that. We scooted it back to next week, and the reason is because uh, I was at Kenneth Copeland's minister's seminar, or minister's conference last week, and Rafael Cruz, Ted Cruz's dad, he got up and spoke, and it was just excellent. Uh, he never mentioned Ted. He uh, took questions later, and there were some other things. But during his presentation, he never mentioned Ted. It wasn't political. It was about how Christians should get involved. And I know that we've already had some ministry on that, but I really wanted to show this video from Kenneth Copeland's Minister's Conference to you and just motivate you to get involved. And the reason we put it this week is because the registration to or the deadline to register and be involved in the Colorado caucuses is February the 1st, which I think is what, Monday? So we had to show it today. Uh, Richard Harris is going to come up at the end and uh, give you some information. We got some things to facilitate helping you get registered and involved. And uh, anyway, I won't preach his message, but I support it 100%. And I tell you what, if we aren't involved, shame on you. Even though I believe in no condemnation, <laughs> come up here and let me slap you. Amen. <laughs> So anyway, this is Rafael Cruz. He's Ted Cruz's dad. He's, uh, he was born in Cuba. He fled from Castro. He was a political uh, exile, and he's now an American citizen, and he's a preacher. He watches me every day on television. We've met a couple of times, and we just have a great uh, relationship. And so I think that this is one of the best presentations I've seen about how Christians should be involved. So I wanted to share it with you, and I encourage you to just uh, listen, open up your heart, and at the end, Richard Harris will come up and share with you about how you can get involved. Okay. All right. Let me just uh, start by giving you a little bit of a story. About three years ago, I was at a pastor's conference in Ames, Iowa. And at that pastor's conference, I heard a statistic by George Barna, who does surveys among evangelicals. And he said that in the 2012 election, there were 12 million evangelical Christians not registered to vote, and another 26 million that didn't vote. That's a total of 38 million evangelicals out of an estimated total of 89 million. That's about 40% of the body of Christ. Now, statistics range anywhere from 38 million to 55 million that didn't vote. This just put such a burden in my heart. I got back home, and I was in my quiet time with the Lord. And the word I heard from the Lord was, if I could blame one group of people for what's happening in America today, it would be my pastor's. The Lord took me to a passage of Scripture that I know very well because it's the Scripture that the Lord used to call me to the ministry. And it was Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 17, which says, Son of man, I call you as a watchman on the wall, basically to do two things. Number one, to hear from me, and number two, to warn my people. And the word that I heard from the Lord very clearly was a mandate, and that mandate was, go tell my pastors to go warn my people. That was about three years ago. In that time, I have done over 120 pastors' conferences all over America and spoken in many more than those churches, practically every Sunday in the morning in one church, in the evening in another church. And I want to share tonight the message that the Lord gave me. And I'm calling it Reclaiming America. And I want to share with you, both from a biblical standpoint and a historical standpoint, why we need to be involved in the civic society. And why, because we have not been involved, America has deteriorated to a sorry state. But God is not finished with America. 
I believe without a shadow of a doubt that America's best days are still ahead. And the catalyst to change America is in this room today. Next slide, please. The Bible says, For no other foundation can any man lay than that which is already laid, which is Jesus Christ. That's the only solid foundation. Next slide. The Bible also says, If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? You see, the world has set up other foundations. I want to talk to you for a couple of minutes about the most important, the most common of this foundation, and that's secular humanism. Next slide. Secular humanism basically says, there is no God. You are your own God. Of course, under that premise, there are no moral absolutes. As a matter of fact, their mantra is, if it feels good, do it. So that society is characterized by a lot of immorality, a lot of debauchery, a lot of crime, a lot of chaos. But here is the sad thing. Secular humanism has crept into a lot of churches across America. And we have many churches in America that preach what I call the social gospel. They're trying to look more like the world with the excuse of attracting the world. The problem is, when the world comes, there's nothing different because they talk and act just like the world. And those churches lose their impact upon society. And then we have this other terminology that we've been hearing so much for the last six, seven years, social justice. I mean, it sounds so good. Who will want social injustice? But what is social justice? Where did that terminology come from? Well, it comes right out of Karl Marx. Social justice is, is collectivism. It is the rights of the group. It denies individual responsibility, which is the biblical concept, and instead it divides society into a series of smaller groups. It makes each group seem like a victim that is in need of a handout. Now let's think about this for a minute. These people do not believe in God, so they cannot rely on God. Individual responsibility is destroyed, so there is no self-reliance. If they cannot rely on God, and there is no self-reliance, the only thing left is to rely upon almighty government. So what it does, it creates a dependent society that I think one of the saddest things about this dependent society is that it destroys the dream. You know, one of the great things about America, one of the very unique things about America is the American dream. Where else on earth can, with hard work and perseverance, anyone see their dreams become a reality? Nowhere but America. But social justice destroys the dream. And it makes people feel, well, this is my lot in life. So people feel trapped. They feel like they are in a circular treadmill and there's no way out. There's a feeling of despondency, a feeling of fatalism. And of course, as this dependent society continues to grow. They become more and more enslaved by a totalitarian government that exerts absolute control over their lives. That is the definition of socialism. Next slide. Now, as I said before, unfortunately, the church has been silent for way too long. And they got a series of excuses that they give you. One of them is separation of church and state. 
Well, separation of church and state is not in the Constitution. It's not in the Declaration. As a matter of fact, to really understand it, we have to go back about 400 years. If you lived in England in the early 1600s, and you were not a member of the Church of England, you were considered a heretic, and you were persecuted. That's what drove the pilgrims to America. Now let's move forward a couple hundred years. When the framers gave us this constitutional representative republic, all col col the colonies were concerned as to whether this new government was going to impose on them a state religion just like their fathers had played from, fled from 200 years before. All 13 colonies were concerned. The Danbury Baptists from Connecticut expressed that concern in a letter to then President Thomas Jefferson. And in order to appease their fears, Thomas Jefferson writes them a letter. Next slide. I want to point out three things in this letter. First of all, Jefferson says, believing with you that religion is matter which lays solely between man and his God. In other words, no one has the right to interfere. It's only between you and God. Number two, that their legislature should not make any law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. In other words, he quotes verbatim the First Amendment of the Constitution. And then he says, thus building a wall of separation between church and state. When we look at those three statements in context, it is absolutely obvious that Jefferson is talking about a one-way wall. A one-way wall to prevent government from interfering with our free exercise of religion. A one-way wall to prevent government from imposing a state religion upon us. In no way, shape, or form could you infer that Jefferson is saying that the church should not have an influence upon every area of society. As a matter of fact, the Word of God tells us exactly the opposite. We should be having an influence upon arts and entertainment, upon the media, upon sports, upon education, upon government. Every area of life. Next slide, please. Well, let's just go down history line. 1962, prayer was removed from schools. A year later, the Bible was removed from schools. Now, there may be some people here old enough to remember when we prayed in school before school started. There were some schools you prayed before every class. Well, in 1962, prayer was thrown out of the public schools. But the, with the second decision, 1963, did you know that one of the very first Bibles printed in America was printed under the auspices of Congress to become the principal textbook in every primary school, high school, and university? And it was so for about 150 years. And then in 1963, all of a sudden, the Bible is thrown out of schools. But here is the sad thing. In spite of these two abominable decisions, the church remains silent. Their excuse is a political issue. How can you call prayer a political issue? How can you call Bible study a political issue? But that's exactly what the church did. The consequence, you can look at the statistics. Teen pregnancy skyrocketed after 1963. It has increased 535%. And so has increased violent crime. All as a result of removing prayer and Bible study from schools. Next slide. Ten years later, 1973, nine unelected justices of the Supreme Court decided that a baby in the womb did not have that unalienable right to life as stated from our Creator in the Declaration of Independence. And they legalized abortion. Again, the great majority of the church remained silent. Same excuse, 
is a political issue. The consequence, over 58 million babies have been murdered in America because of abortion. God help us. We as the Church of Jesus Christ should be on our faces repenting corporately for the sin of America, the sin of abortion. The blood of 58 million babies cries out to God like the blood of Abel did. Next slide. And then in June of last year, the church decided that God got it wrong. And actually, marriage is not what the Word of God says it is. I'll tell you, this decision of June 26th of last year is not really about sex, same-sex marriage. It is a decision against religious liberty in America. And it is about time that we draw a line in the sun and we say, no more, we will take it, no more. When Jesus talked about the ecclesia, the church, again in Greek society, the ecclesia were the movers and the shakers. They were the people that ruled society, not the ones that were confined in the four walls of, the ring, of a room singing hallelujah while the world is going down the drain. We have missed it. But I'll tell you something. The devil always overplays his hand. And there is a silver lining in this horrible decision of June 26. This decision is finally acting as a catalyst to wake up the sleeping giant, to wake up the church, finally. Next slide. Now the question is, how long are we going to remain silent? But there's a much more important question, and it is this. Are we going to have to answer to God for our silence? Silence is not optional. Pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, silence in the face of evil is evil itself. He also said, not to speak is to speak. Not to act is to act. Silence is not an option. Next slide, please. Now, here is another excuse that you hear very often from some very well-meaning pastors. And it is, oh, God just called me to preach the gospel. And they'll tell you in that same sanctimonious way. Well... My answer, next slide, to those people is, tell me what is the gospel? Because the gospel is a lot more than John 3.16. As a matter of fact, instead of my answering that question, let me let the Apostle Paul answer that question. Next slide. In Acts chapter 20, the Apostle Paul says, My hands are free from the blood of all men, because I have not shown to declare unto you the whole counsel of God. First of all, he was referring to Ezekiel chapter 3, and again to Ezekiel chapter 33, where the Word of God says, If you do not warn the wicked of his wicked ways, he will die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require of your hands. Next verse. But if you warn the wicked of his wicked ways, and he does not turn from it, he will die in his iniquity, but you have redeemed your soul. Our responsibility is to warn the wicked. How the wicked responds is between that person and God. And he said, what did Paul say? I have not shown to declare unto you the whole counsel of God. The whole counsel of God goes from Genesis 1-1 to the end of Revelation. Jesus said, you're the light of the world. But let me tell you what we do in too many churches. People come to church with their little flashlights, pointing the light on one another. Boy, are we great about criticizing one another. Are we great about gossiping 
about one another. Have you ever heard about the pious gossip? Brother Kenneth, I need you to pray about poor Susie because let me tell you what Susie is doing. Yeah. And so this request for prayer is an excuse for gossip. But you know something? Light is worthless unless you point it to darkness. That's out there in the marketplace. We got to stop just playing church inside the four walls. We got to take the church out of the building, out into the marketplace. Next slide. Jesus also said, you're the salt of the earth. You know, salt is a preserver. But in order for salt to preserve anything, you have to put it upon that which you want to preserve. It is about time that we fight to preserve the sanctity of life. It is about time that we fight to preserve the sanctity of marriage. It's about time we fight to preserve the sexual purity of our teenagers. Now there's a message. Next, next slide, please. Now here is the most common excuse of them all. As a matter of fact, I will guarantee you Everybody in this room has heard this excuse. Perhaps some of you have even said it. Politics is a dirty business. I don't want any part of it. Have you heard it? Come on, you can answer me. Have you heard it? I'm not going to ask you if you said it. <laughs> Politics is a dirty business. I don't want any part of it. And you wash your hand just like Pontius Pilate. Next slide, please. Look at Proverbs 29, 2. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. When the wicked beareth rule, people mourn. If the righteous, the people of God, the people that believe in the Word of God, if those people are not voting, are not even running for office, what is left? The wicked electing the wicked and we get what we deserve. Next slide. Now let me shock you a little bit. Did you know that the Bible tells you exactly who to, who to vote for? The Bible very, very clearly tells you who to vote for. Let me put it in context. Moses has just crossed the Red Sea. And now Moses is in the wilderness trying to govern over two million people. And Moses is going bananas. And here comes his brother-in-law, Jethro. And he says, Moses, what you're doing is not good. You can't sit around judging people from morning until evening, basically saying you're going to burn out. And then in Exodus chapter 18, verse 21, next slide, God says, moreover, you shall select from among the people. Now note this. God doesn't say, I will appoint. No, 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 no. You select, which is the same as you elect. If you go to Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 13, God speaks through Moses and he says, you choose from among the people wise men, men of understanding, and I will make them rulers over all your tribes. You choose, you select, you elect. That's a responsibility God has laid on us. And then in Exodus 18, 21, God gives us four qualifications. Able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness. I'm going to repeat it for this side. Able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness. Next slide. You look at the Declaration of Independence. There's over 20 grievances against King George in the Declaration of Independence. But did you know that each and every one of those grievances were preached from the pulpits of America for 10 years before Jefferson wrote them on the Declaration of Independence? It was preachers from the pulpit calling out King George 
for the atrocities that the British were perpetrating upon the American people. Where are those preachers today? Well, unfortunately, most of them are hiding behind their pulpits. As a matter of fact, many people think that the American Revolution started in the 1770s, but that's not true. The American Revolution started in the 1730s with men like Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield and many others, and the first great awakening was the spark that ignited the American Revolution. As a matter of fact, you cannot separate the first great awakening from the American Revolution. They are so intertwined that they are one and the same. At lunchtime, as I was chatting with Kenneth and Gloria, I shared with them that I believe that what we saw in the 1700s was a dual revival. There was a spiritual and a political revival all tied into one. It started in the 1730s, and it swept through the colonies. And I'll tell you what, what we saw was something so unprecedented that it basically changed America. As a matter of fact, let me just ask you a trivia question. Do you know where Paul Revere was going when he was making his famous ride? The British are coming, the British are coming. He was going somewhere, next slide. He was going to the home of a pastor, a pastor by the name of Jonas Clark. At his home, there were two patriots hiding, John Hancock and Samuel Adams, the two most wanted men by the British Army. They had orders to take him back to England to be hung for sedition. As a matter of fact, of course you know what was the first battle for our independence. The Battle of Lexington, right? But did you know that the Battle of Lexington was fought right outside Pastor Jonas Clark's church? As a matter of fact, in the Battle of Lexington, there were eight colonies that died. Seven of them were members of Pastor Jonas Clark's church because the pastor along with all the members of the congregation, were an integral part of that battle. Let me tell you about another pastor. Next slide. His name was Pastor Muhlenberg, Pastor John Peter Muhlenberg. Early 1776, Pastor John Peter Muhlenberg is preaching at his church. He wore long black robes like many pastors on that day, the British Army hated them and feared them. They called them the Black Robe Regiment. Pastor Peter Muhlenberg is preaching at his church on Ecclesiastes chapter 3. He concludes his message in verse 8 that says there's a time for war and a time for peace. Pastor Peter Muhlenberg says this is a time for war. He unbuttons his black robe and as he opens it, it uncovers his colonel's uniform in the Continental Army. He looked at his congregation and he said, how many of you men will follow me to go fight for our independence? 300 men left that Sunday to go follow John Peter Muhlenberg, Colonel Pastor John Peter Muhlenberg, to go fight for our independence. That is our heritage. That has been erased from our history books. Next slide, please. Now, you know, the progressives, the secular humanists will like to tell you that the framers were a bunch of secularists, that they were so-called deists. Nothing could be further from the truth. Did you know that 29 of the 56 signers of the Declaration were seminary graduates? They were deeply committed men of God. But you see, when those framers were on their knees, God gave them a totally different model for government. No longer authority flows from God to the government to the people, but rather authority flows from God to the people to the government. From God to the people to the government. You see, 
It is not coincidental that the first three words in the Constitution are what? We, the people. Because all authority under the Constitution by inspiration of God is upon we, the people. And with that authority comes an awesome responsibility for us to elect righteous leaders. God has given us a stewardship of this country, not to government officials, but to we the people. We are the ones that are entrusted with that stewardship, and we are to elect righteous leaders. <laughs> Let me step on some toes, and if I step on some toes, you'll say, ouch. If not, you'll say, praise the Lord. This is uh, Charles Finney from the Second Great Awakening. He's talking to a series of preachers, and he says, Brethren, our preaching will bear its legitimate fruits. If immorality prevails in the land, the fault is ours to a great degree. He's talking to preachers. If there is a decay of conscience, is there a decay of conscience today? <laughs> Finney says the pulpit is responsible for it. Next slide. If the public press lacks moral discrimination, oh my, oh my, oh my. Public press today is nothing more than a propaganda machine spewing out the talking points of the administration. No regard for the truth whatsoever. As a matter of fact, in most communist countries around the world, you have an entity or government called the Ministry of Propaganda. The dissenters call it a minis the Ministry of Misinformation. All right, and what, is, what does he say? He doesn't blame the press. He says the pulpit is responsible for it. Look at the next one. If the church is degenerate and worldly, he says the pulpit is responsible for it. If the world loses its interest in religion, the pulpit is responsible for it. Next slide. Look at this next two. If Satan rules the halls of legislation. Wow, it seems like we're reading this week's newspaper, doesn't it? But he doesn't blame the politicians. He says the pulpit is responsible for it. Look at the next one. If our politics has become so corrupt that the very foundation of our government is ready to fall away, Again, he doesn't blame the politicians. He says the pulpit is responsible for it. Why does he blame the pulpit instead of the politicians? You'll understand it with the next slide. Let us not ignore this fact, my dear brethren, but let us lay it to heart and be thoroughly awake to our responsibility in respect to the morals of this nation. You see, the biggest lie that the church has swallowed is this. And again, I'm sure many of you have heard it. Politics cannot legislate morality. That is a lie. Politics legislates morality all the time. What do you think it was when they legislated prayer out of school? When they legislated the Bible out of school? When they legislated in favor of abortion? When they now legislated in favor of destroying the traditional marriage? Is that not legislating morality? Let's think back on Proverbs 29, 2. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. When the wicked rule, people mourn. Again, if the righteous are not running for office, if the righteous are not even voting and voting for righteousness, all that is left is the wicked electing the wicked. And if the wicked are in authority, they are going to legislate their wicked brand of morality. Next slide. This is another pastor in Germany during the Second World War, Martin Niemuller. He said, first they came for the socialists. And I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists. And I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Next slide. Then they came for the Jews. And I didn't speak out because I was not a Jew. Finally, they came for me. And there was no one left to speak on my behalf. Pastor Martin E. Mueller was a Lutheran pastor. And as a Lutheran pastor, he dressed all in black with a pastoral collar. He is arrested one evening, thrown into a holding tank with a bunch of drunks. The next morning, 
a Lutheran chaplain dressed just like Nee Mueller walks into that jail and sees this guy dressed just like him in that cell, and he says, Brother, why are you in there? Nee Mueller looks at him and says, Considering what's happening in our nation today, why are you not in here with me? You see, there comes a time where we cannot stand by the sidelines anymore. We got to get in the bottle. Next slide. You know, I, I don't know about you, but the greatest goal in my life, nothing even comes close, is to one day hear my Savior say, well done, good and faithful servant. Nothing else matters. What are we doing and why are we doing if it's not to honor and glorify Him? Next slide. I want to leave you with five action steps. You know, I agree we must start with Second Chronicles 7, 14. We must start on our knees. If my people who are called by my name, that's us, that's the people of God, that's not the heathen, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then God says, I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. But Second Chronicles 7, 14 is only half the equation. The second half is Second Corinthians 5, 20 which says that we are ambassadors for Christ. That means we are God's representatives here on earth. We are God's hands, we are God's peace, feet, we are God's mouthpiece. And Jesus said, shout it from the housetops. We got to put feet to our prayer. We got to, in prayer, we got to the presence of God, to have communion from, with God, to seek His presence, to seek His anointing, to be empowered by Him to get a vision and a direction to then get off our knees and go do what He's told us to do. We need to start making sure everybody in our congregations understand that voting is our civic responsibility. If you don't vote, you have no right to complain because you become part of the problem. Let me tell you, the wicked are all going to the polls. So if you don't go to the polls, you're voting for the wicked. Now, that starts with being registered to vote. All across America, I've been encouraging pastors, you should have a voter registration table in the lobby of your church every Sunday. Every Sunday. You know, as a matter of fact, I grow, work with a group, of, a, a group that I've done maybe some 30 pastors' conferences with, and they promote something that is called Stand Up Sunday. And basically to say to the pastor, so say to your congregation, all right, if you're registered to vote, please stand up. And then to the one sitting down, go right out that table, there's a voter registration table out there. <laughs> well, I was visiting with Pastor John Hagee in San Antonio last year, and I shared this with him, and John says to me, will I do one better than that? I asked the people who are registered to vote to stand, then I have my ushers pass voter registration tables to everybody, voter registration cards to everybody that's sitting down. Well, I was in Albuquerque, New Mexico, preaching at a very large church. I mentioned that to the pastor, and he said, oh, I do one better than that. <laughs> I asked the people who are registered to vote to stand. Then I have the ushers pass voter registration cards to everybody sitting down. Then I put a PowerPoint up, and I said, all right, get your pen. We're going to fill them out right now. I said, my hat's off to you, man. <laughs> but we got to make sure the body of Christ is registered to vote. Amen. You know, if you look at 1980, it was the body of Christ that elected Ronald Reagan. Amen. We mobilized millions of Christians across America, and it became the Reagan Revolution. It was the body of Christ that did it. And let me tell you something, in 1980, we didn't have internet, we didn't have email, we didn't have Facebook, we didn't have Twitter, we didn't have bloggers, we didn't even have conservative radio. We did it in 1980, we can do it again. If the body of Christ will unify and come together. Number two, 
We need to preach the whole counsel of God. Again, let me refer to George Barna for a minute. George Barna did a survey right after the 2014 elections. He asked a group of preachers, do you believe that the Bible addresses every issue facing America today? 90% said yes. And that sounds very good until you hear the second question. Second question was, do you preach on the biblical solutions to those problems? Less than 10% said yes. God help us. We need to preach the whole counsel of God. Num next slide. Number three, encourage pastors, encourage people of faith to run for public office. I got several friends that are state representatives. They're state senators, they're county commissioners, they're in the school board, they're in city council, they're mayors, and they're still preaching their churches. They have two advantages. One, they're bringing the Word of God, they're bringing righteousness to the halls of legislation. And number two, they have a whole congregation praying for them. Number four, become informed about what these candidates stand for. Don't take their word. Look at their records. Fortunately, there are many organizations, Christian organizations, that publish what are called voters guides. In very graphical form, they tell you what every, every one of these candidates stand for. By the way, I see some people taking copious notes. Anybody who wants it, just give me your card, put PP on the card, and I'll email you this PowerPoint. Just give me a card and put PP on it, and I will email it to you. And number five, Vote for candidates that uphold the principles of the Word of God. We need to stop voting tradition. We need to start voting conviction. We need to work, vote for righteousness. If we do that, we're going to see America restored. Let me finish with the last slide. The framers in the Declaration of Independence, last sentence, in the Declaration of Independence and for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge with each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Our lives are under attack from the cradle to the grave, and in between our quality of life is being eroded by taxation and regulation. Our, church, our treasure, our fortunes. Let me tell you something. This government's got both hands in your pocket, trying to take every hard-earned dollar you make to give it out in handouts to buy votes. But I'll tell you something. They may take our lives. They may take our fortunes. But no one can take our honor. No one can take your honor. You have to surrender that yourselves. Let me share something with you. We have been seeing all these horrible, horrible things that has been happening with ISIS, where they have been decapitating Christians, men, women, and children. But let me tell you, they have been telling these people, renounce Christ or we will cut your heads off. But let me tell you the story that we have not heard even once. Not even for a child. No, 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 no. Don't cut my head off. I will renounce Christ. Not one. Or oh, that we may have that integrity of our faith. Our faith has not been tested to that level. But make sure that you're ready when it happens. I would like to finish with our doing something, our making a covenant with one another before God, the very same covenant that those framers did. If you would like to do that, just the very same words that those framers did, I want to ask you to stand. I'm going to repeat this covenant one statement at a time. I want to re you to repeat it after me, before God, from the heart, relying upon the protection of divine providence. We mutually pledge to each other, mutually pledge to each other. Our, lives, our lives, 
our fortunes, our fortunes and, our and our sacred honor to do all we can to exalt the name of Jesus Christ in America. To do all we can to restore righteousness in America. To make America it again that shining city on a hill to the glory of God. God bless you. God bless America. Glory. Glory, Amen. glory, glory. Okay, praise God. Was that awesome? Yes. Man, that was awesome. I got choked up, and that's the fourth time I've watched that. Uh, he said so much in there that was incredible, but one of the things that's the most important that he said was that we are stewards of something here. Um, by the inspiration of God, our founding fathers gave us the right to vote. And I want to submit to you guys that the very least, the absolute bottom, the least thing that you can do is faithfully exercise that gift, that right to vote as a believer. You know, Jesus said, to whom much is given, much shall be required. And every single American citizen <clears throat> can say that to you, much is given. And, and this right to vote is a precious thing, and don't let it go to waste. So what I want to do this morning is I want to talk to you about how you can register to vote. If we could have that website displayed on the screen. Colorado has made it incredibly easy to register to vote. All you need to do if you're not registered here is to go to this website, GoVoteColorado.com, and it's, the, it's a specific page in the Secretary of State's website, and you click where it says register to vote, and it will walk you right through. In about five minutes' time, you will be registered to vote in Colorado. And then they will actually, you don't even have to get out of your warm recliner to go vote. All you need to do is go check your mail, okay? They will mail the ballots to you. You understand? It's so easy in this state. But you know what, if, you don't, if you're not comfortable uh, getting online and doing it that way or you're not sure you're able to do that, we're going to have ushers at the door after this uh, morning session is over and they're gonna, you can take with you today a paper registration form that you can complete and mail in to the Secretary of, Secretary of State's office and you will become registered to vote. So you heard uh, Pastor Cruz talk about Stand Up Sunday. I want to do Stand Up Thursday here. And I'd like to ask that everybody in this room that is registered to vote in Colorado, please stand up. Awesome. Okay, that's good, but take a look around. The rest of you need to get registered here. You're going to be in Colorado for at least a year, probably two, and hopefully three years. And while you're here, you need to be a good steward of this gift that God has given to you. So go to this website, guys, or pick up a form on your way. You may be seated. Now let me just say a few things about this, okay? You need to be a United States citizen, number one. You need to have either a driver's license or a state ID card. Uh, you can also do it with other forms of identification like a passport and so on, but you've got to have some ID uh, to prove who you are, okay? So that shouldn't be a problem. By the way, if you're, you need to get a Colorado driver's license. You're going to be here for three years, okay? So, um, but uh, even without a license, driver's license, you can do it. You just have to be a resident of Colorado for at least 22 days before the election. So everybody here is going to meet that qualification, okay? You understand? All right, so uh, if you have questions, you're in, trying to register and you, you can't quite figure out what to put down or whatever, on the back of this form, there are phone numbers uh, for you to call if you have questions. There's also more information on that same very website there. So uh, you should be able to get all your questions answered. But I'm going to go one further and tell you that if you still can't figure it out, I want you to contact me, okay? So get out a pencil and paper right now. You got 20 seconds. I want you to write down this website, and then I want you to write down my email address, okay? If, you, if you're concerned that you won't be able to figure that out, my email address is Richard Harris, okay, at awmcaris.com, okay? Richard Harris at awmcaris.com. 
Thanks, guys. It's going to be a great year.